Did you know? That sound alone takes up an entire eighth of the space on the game cartridge. Then on the following screen, the game never tells you to press the start button because they forgot to clear the Sega logo from RAM. How's it going guys? My name's Colin, aka CC Backslash from Channel 3. There's a lot to cover today, so hold on to your butts and jump it down the Genesis rabbit hole. The Sega Genesis was released in North America on August 14, 1989. It was originally marketed as having true arcade games, great graphics, and stereo sound. True arcade games, great graphics, real challenge, stereo sound. Sega Who gives you two stereo speakers free so you hear the great stereo sound of Genesis? Sega They weren't lying either. In essence, it was a scaled down version of the Megatech hardware they were using in arcade machines around the same time. It offered 16-bit graphics and sound, which wasn't common in home consoles at the time, and originally included a copy of Altered Beast to show it off. Bundle games later included Sonic the Hedgehog, Sonic 2, and Streets of Rage 2. Say it. Say it. Sega! In 1993, Sega released the Genesis Model 2, a smaller, revised version that consumed less power, output stereo sound, and was designed to match the Sega CD Model 2, released that same year. This was when Sega really went crazy with their marketing campaigns and bundle deals. It wasn't uncommon to see Sega Spinball, Super Hang-On, or Joe Montana Football included with Model 2s. 1994 saw the release of the Genesis CDX. It combined a portable Walkman, Genesis, and Sega CD in one unit. It came with three Sega CD games to offset the hefty $400 price tag. Sonic CD, Echo the Dolphin, and the Sega Classics Arcade Collection. It was only produced for one year, and is highly sought after today. The final official Sega Genesis released was The Nomad in 1995. It was essentially a Game Gear that let you play Genesis cartridges on the go. Only one million units were ever manufactured, and it was only available in the US, making it even rarer than the CDX. Sega! After Sega discontinued official production in late 1997, Majesco continued to manufacture fully licensed Genesis Model 3s until 1999. They included lower quality controllers, no games, had mono sound, and no Sega CD support, but they were as cheap as $20 and made for a great low-cost gaming option at the time. Sega of America marketed the Genesis as the cool kid system throughout the 90s and sought to capture an older teenage to adult audience as Nintendo dominated in younger demographics. They weren't shy about taking jabs at their competitor either. Their licensing fees were cheap, and they employed their own rating system, so they weren't really worried about censoring much. As a result, its game library became diverse unfiltered, and at times, experimental. It was also the best console available if you enjoyed sports games, as it had the biggest selection and developers could take advantage of the more powerful processor. The Sega Genesis has blast processing. Super Nintendo doesn't. So what's blast processing do? And just what was blast processing anyway? Long story short, it was just marketing mumbo jumbo. In 2009, Scott Bayless took the blame for coining the term by accident. He was talking with public relations and mentioned offhand you could blast the decoder with data, and they just took his words and ran with it.
Early 1994, my parents brought home a Sega Genesis Model 2 with a copy of Sonic the Hedgehog 2. I'm sure the main reason they got one was because my dad wanted it, but I did do a lot of begging for quarters to play Miss Pac-Man and Centipede at the laundromat, so that may have had something to do with it. They hunted bargain mints for games because they were really expensive back then, but most of the games we played early on were rentals from Blockbuster. I can still remember my earliest gaming memories, marveling at the speed of Sonic, not even racing games were that fast, playing Chuck Rock 2 with my mom, and helping her with the infuriating puzzles of Fantastic Dizzy. And waking up super late when my dad got home from working second shift so we could play Dragon's Revenge. Later that year, my brother was born, and I couldn't wait to show him the coolest video game system I'd ever seen. Sadly, in late 1995, our house got broken into, and they stole our Genesis and anything else they thought was valuable. I couldn't believe someone would do such a thing. I cried, not for the games, but because I couldn't share them with my baby brother. In 1996, my parents got another Sonic 2 bundle. It may have been a Christmas present, but I'm not sure. I'd give my brother the second controller so he could play Tails and help me on the bonus stages. Then later we'd race split screen. Near Christmas 97, my parents found the holy grail of bargain bin finds, Earthworm Jim. I used to rent the TV show on VHS and I had no idea it was a game at the time. All four of us spent hours trying to beat that game and laughing at the absurdity. Ruby! Fast forward to Christmas 1999, Santa brought us a Nintendo 64. My brother and I slowly stopped playing Sega in favor of our new system, and in 2001, my parents gave the Genesis to one of the kids in the neighborhood who didn't have any video games. I'm not gonna lie, I was upset at the time, but when my mom told me why they gave it away, I did my best to understand it. We grew up pretty modestly, so having a game console at all was a really big deal. We didn't have cable TV, but we always had games to play and we were never bored. I'm forever grateful for that, and everything they made happen for us. Thanks mom and dad. Later on, when I was in 8th grade, a classic game store called N2 Games opened up about a mile from my house and started sending out flyers. My shop was only a mile or so from my school, so I started saving my birthday money and allowance. When I thought I had enough money, I finished my last class of the day at school, walked out the front door past the buses, and hurried down the street to see what all the fuss was about. It was awesome. If you wanted it, they had it, and if they didn't, they could find it. The two owners were as excited as I was to talk about old video games, and I left them know I was looking for a lost piece of childhood. Sega Genesis Model 2. They were running a special at the time, a system in five games at just the right price. They were willing to sell me a Nomad bundle for the same price too, 
And I really should have taken it, those things are rare. They even let me play it in the store, but I had my heart set on Model 2. It even had a broken reset button, just like our old one did. I took it home, and the rest is history. I've hung on to this thing for over 16 years now, and it's still running strong. I only found out recently that I hit the jackpot on motherboard revisions too. And if you're wondering what games I chose, her Genesis selection wasn't huge, but I walked out with Skitchin, Street Fighter 2, Mortal Kombat 1 and 2, Tecmo Super Bowl, and of course, Earthworm Jim and Sonic 2. I had to buy the last two separately, but I had to have them. If you're new to Sega, or new to retro gaming in general, and you're looking for a place to start, I highly recommend the Sega Genesis Mini. It's cheap, very hackable if you want to go down that route, the emulation is great, and the library of games is top notch. None of the games included feel like filler, and many of them are ridiculously expensive in cartridge form. It even includes the unreleased Sega version of Tetris, which is possibly the most bizarre official version in existence. The hardware was designed and manufactured by Sega for Sega. It's super portable, comes with two three-button USB controllers that also work on your PC, and look at this, a fake game door and a Sega CD door. These things are awesome. AV cables for your Sega can be easily found online, but not all cables are created equal. Hopefully I can save you the headache I've been through. The first set I got came from Retrobit. I usually give their brand high praise, but their Genesis cables are wired up to the mono channel and the right speaker, instead of right and left, resulting in wonky sound and a very confused TV. The composite cables I use at the moment came from old school. The sound is stereo this time, thankfully, but right and left are swapped. I guess if they can't spell school, you can't expect them to know their rights from their lefts. At least it's an easy fix. Model 1s and Model 3s output mono sound from the back, so working cables are probably easier to find. Just something to keep in mind. Finding the right power brick for your Genesis can be a real pain in the ass. I have two Model 2s, and they use two different plugs. One of them is from the near of the end of the system's lifespan, so that may have something to do with it, but the power brick for the earlier system says Genesis Model 2 and 3, so I don't know what the heck is going on. For my primary system, I use a power brick that I got from Retrogen. It's light, cool, quiet, and cheap. Also quick side note. I found out years ago that in a pinch, you can use the power supply for a PS2 Slim, and it fits perfectly and runs fine, though I wouldn't do that long term, the, the voltages don't quite match up. I'm not sure how high bad it is to find the brick for a Model 1, but they should all have the same plug. In any case, the best power supply would be the factory original, but as long as the plug fits and the output matches the input on the bottom of your system, you should be fine. Under the hood, the Sega Genesis combines hardware from early 80s computers and electronic keyboards to produce its signature look and sound. If you're familiar with how a traditional PC works, Genesis is similar, but different. Think more along the lines of a calculator or an arcade machine. It has two main processors, a 16-bit Motorola 68K, running at a blistering 7.6 MHz, and an 8-bit Z-Log Z80, running at 4 MHz. The 68K handles most functions, while the Z80 is used to control the sound chips. Installed is 72 kilobytes of system RAM, and 64 kilobytes of dedicated video RAM. 
Sound, the most important feature of any Sega, is provided by two chips for two different sets of noises. Beeps and boops, like engine noises, are handled by a Texas Instruments PSG that's built into the VDP. While most music is handled by a Yamaha YM2612 FM synthesis chip, this is what produces the signature crunchy metallic sound. Model 1's all included a Sony-sourced headphone amp, providing a stereo sound option, as the rear jack outputs mono only. Last but not least, high-definition graphics are provided by a Sony VDP, and a built-in dedicated color memory capable of handling four palettes at a time, each containing 16 colors, out of an available 512. This is also where the PSG lives. Also of note, the Sedge connector here on the side provides communication with the Sega CD. Synchronization of all this mess probably happens within the onboard ASICs. What I do know is that these chips are where Sega integrated many of the main components later on to save space, power consumption, and cost. This is where the Sega rabbit hole gets kinda complicated, but trust me, we'll get through this together. I've tried my best to make this all easy to digest. So, you know there were three different main models of Genesis released. Well, not all systems were created equal. During its 10-year lifespan, four versions of Model 1, seven versions of Model 2, and two versions of Model 3 were released in the United States. They each have their own quirks and flaws, but the primary defining factor is sound quality, which is especially apparent when playing older games. That may sound crazy today, but remember this was the time before game systems had software updates. If you wanted to make any changes, it required all new hardware. Let's take a look at this graph. There's a lot going on here, and I'm really sorry if you're colorblind, but I'll walk you through it all. First at the bottom is the timeline of release as I understand it from information I've found online, color-coded to match the system column on the left. For revisions made within the same year, I applied the same half-year system used in the car industry, but for all I know, the .8 in VA 1.8 could mean that it was revised in August. Each model has its own row containing every hardware revision available. I wish I could tell you what VA stood for, but I couldn't find an answer online, so I just refer to them as Virginians. Each Virginian is color-coded to represent quality of experience based on general consensus of the retro gaming community. It doesn't necessarily represent how I feel about each one. In my opinion, there's no such thing as a bad Genesis, except for you at games. But if you're picky, this should help. If you're looking for a candidate for RGB and soundboard mods, I'd pick one of the bad systems as your starting point. You'll get a better improvement over stock, and the motherboards are bigger and usually easier to work with. Model 1s in the Sega Retro community are broken into two categories based on whether or not they include the words high definition graphics on the system shell. The Model 2s apparently took a while to perfect. Something to keep in mind with Model 3s, they're listed as OK here for their mono only sound, but the audio and video quality is actually really good. The CDX was only produced for one year, saving it from the Virginia treatment. Its rating on this chart is only for cartridge-based performance. Being a multi-function machine, it has a little bit of a Swiss Army knife effect, but it's arguably the best for playing Sega CD. I won't discuss this one too much in depth though, that'll come in a later video. The Nomad hanging down here isn't a bad system, it's actually really rad, it's just bad when hooked up to a TV. Audio is muffled, has a pronounced hiss, but hey, it's a 90s handheld, so just having that option was awesome. To quickly summarize what Sega was trying to do, every year they'd integrate more chips, try out new designs, and decrease the amount of capacitors and components they had to install. Early Model 2s and late Model 1s are notorious for squeaky and harsh sound, and this mostly has to do with the change in design requiring differing amounts of filter through the capacitors. For those who are interested, I've created a chart here listing every major component that's commonly expected to be found in each Virginian. What I'd like to point out here is that it's not always the components themselves, but how they were implemented and how the sound signal was filtered that really makes a difference. Mm -hmm. 
Even though there are so many motherboard Virginians, finding out which one you've got is a pretty simple process. I promise you won't even have to take your system apart. You can call me the Decker Kane of Sega, because I'm about to show you how to identify your Genesis and its quality. Quick side note, I've seen people asking about these a few times recently. If you bought a Model 1 Mega Drive from Japan, and it has this extra daughter board here at the bottom, congratulations. You've got a system from the first run ever made, the Virginian Zero. This extra board was added to rectify problems they found right before they released it. To identify a Model 1, the first thing you should look for is the high definition graphics badge near the game door. Next, flip the Genesis over and take a look at its FCC ID number. The earliest models in the US have the ID FJ846E USA Sega. They boot straight into the game and they use Virginians 2 and 3, the only major difference between them being the brand of CPU found inside. After 1992, the ID was shortened to just FJ8. USA Sega, and a licensing screen was added thanks to a court battle with Accolade. These will have Virginian 6s, but are rare to find in this configuration. These three revisions are considered to be the best among Genesis purists, and early games were programmed with this specific hardware in mind. If your system doesn't have high definition graphics printed on top, take a look around back. If the shell has a blank space where the previously unused 9 pin port used to be, you've got a Virginian 6. If the shell sits flush with the I.O. ports, bad news, you've got a Virginian 7. These are considered to be the worst revision Genesis of all time, but would make a good candidate for mods. Expect weird sound and fuzzy video with these. Every Model 2 looks exactly the same from the outside, but I promised you wouldn't have to take your system apart. There are a couple of tricks you can do. The easiest to identify are the latest models, Virginians 3 and 4. Look for these if you want the best Model 2 experience. First, flip your Genesis over and take a look through the vents at the motherboard shield. These revisions utilize a 3 quarters motherboard and they leave a gap to one side. The Virginia 3 will have a solid shield all the way through. This was the last revision to use discrete CPUs and sound hardware, and they finally worked out the sound bugs. I personally prefer this revision over any other. The Virginia 4 will have two cutouts here in the shield. This is the most refined and best of all the Model 2s, integrating all functions into only six chips. If your motherboard shield extends to the edge of the system, you've got one of the earlier Model 2s. These are not the best, but can deliver a decent experience depending on what chips are installed. When Model 1 fans say they don't like the Model 2, these are the systems they likely played. To identify your specific revision, open the game door and take a look inside at the traces leading up to the cartridge slot. On the earliest Model 2, the Virginian Zero, you'll find a row of feed-throughs at the top left that aren't there on any other revision. Virginians 1 and 1.8 share the same board. Look for these wide, sort of triangular traces here on the far left. These three revisions offer poor sound performance comparable to the VA7 Model 1, and video quality varies greatly depending on what chip is installed inside. Sega is still trying to figure out how to filter the distortion caused from the newly integrated chips. Steer clear of these if you can. Virginian 2s will have sparse, evenly spaced spaghetti traces all the way across. On Virginian 2.3s, look for these two thick traces here in the middle. The rest will be fairly thin and hard to see. These two revisions are a bad choice if you plan to attach them to a Sega CD or a 32X. Sound is filtered too much, it comes out kind of muffled, and the PSG sounds kind of weird. Despite this, video quality isn't too bad, as long as it has a quality VDP. The Model 3 is tough to identify because the motherboard shield extends to the game door, but it can be done with a good set of eyes or a magnifying glass. Take note that neither revision is compatible with the Game Genie, Sega CD, or Virtual Racing. Despite this, it has some of the best video quality of any Genesis. If you don't mind mono sound, you can find these for pretty cheap. The Virginia one will have one big trace near the center here, and the rest will be spread far apart. The sound is great, but it may have a background hiss on this one. On the Virginia 2, look for these diagonal traces on the left. The pattern should continue until reversing past the center. The revision is identical to the Virginia 1 minus the hiss, plus some bass. The CDX and the Nomad were only produced for one year and have one Virginian each. These are rad, trust me. 
The only common problem on the CDX is a laser assembly dying out, but they're cheap and easy to find. The Nomad is notorious for capacitors drying out, but those are cheap and easy to do. If you're looking for the best Sega CD experience and don't want to deal with two consoles, get the CDX. If you're already a Sega fan and you want the coolest classic handheld ever made, do yourself a favor and find a good deal on a Nomad. We've taken a look under the hood, so you know Genesis is all solid state with no moving parts. There's not even a fan to go bad. Anyway, with a little bit of care, the system will last for years to come. Although it lacks any kind of cooling solution, heat generation isn't a huge issue, even on older systems. Just follow what the user manual said, keep it out of direct sunlight, and let it breathe a little bit, and you're good to go. Also stated in the user manual, don't use your power button as a reset button, that is, don't double click it. The capacitors inside warm up quickly, but take a while to normalize back down. Power cycling like this causes unnecessary wear and tear, and risks damaging chips, which aren't easy to replace. Rule of thumb, just wait 10 to 20 seconds before hitting power again. Go get a snack, get up and stretch or something. Take care of yourself, and your system. Generally speaking, unless lightning, a bad power supply, or static electricity fries one of your chips, the only things that can go bad from age and mileage are the electrolytic capacitors on the motherboard. If you're not familiar with what these cappy boys do, basically they stabilize and smooth voltage in a circuit. They're used in power supplies, audio converters, video converters, game cartridges. Every modern electronic device has capacitors inside. Internally, caps are similar to rechargeable batteries, and, like batteries, they have a limited service life. As they get old and dry out inside your Genesis, sound quality will decrease and the video signal will get fuzzy and dark. When they go bad, they can cease to function, leak out onto the board they're mounted to, or worse, explode. Capacitors are expected to last around 15 to 20 years or so, so even if you've got the newest Genesis, if you've never done it before, it's about time to think about doing a recap, especially if you plan to play it a few times a week. Old gain systems are fine for light, casual use as is, but new caps will give you the best results and longevity. For spare parts, my go-to site at the moment is Console 5. I got packs of capacitors for both of my Genesis's and a full rebuild for my Sega CD. They organize everything by motherboard revision, so if you watch the previous section, you know where to start. Also, big shout out to Retrobit, their AV cables may be stupid. And they make a brand new six button controller using their original molds for Genesis and USB. For everything else, I've gone to eBay, Amazon, and sometimes even Etsy. Most Genesis games don't save any data on the cartridge, so 90% of the time you have nothing to worry about. The capacitor can go bad, but from what I've read, they're not totally necessary to function. They just prevent voltage spikes to the ROM chip on startup, so you'll probably be fine. To clean the contacts, use a Q-tip or something like a 1-up card and some alcohol. Work back and forth to clean, flip to dry, and corrosion and dirt should come right off. Also, quick side note, if you have a 10 gen game that doesn't work, they're notorious for trace rot from low quality materials, so a lot of the time you could do some open cart surgery and resurrect your dead game. As for the game door itself, keep the flaps clean and free from debris. You, you don't want that crap inside your system. If you're getting a bad connection with known good carts, you can use a 1-up cart or similar, and clean the teeth pretty easy peasy. Troubleshooting is pretty quick and painless. If your game doesn't load, the first step is to clean its contacts, and if you have the right stuff, clean the cartridge slot inside the game door. This works 99.9% .9 of the time, but if it still doesn't load and the other games work, it's likely the cartridge's fault. Blowing your cart or the door isn't advised, but I mean, come on, we all do it. Sometimes it just magically works. If you feel the system's teeth aren't holding onto your games and making a good connection, you can bend them into place with a pick or a tiny screwdriver. This wouldn't be where I start, but things happen, and it's definitely an easier job than bending back the pens on a CPU. If you're getting a wonky sound, see the previous section on AV cables first, but if it's not the cables, it's one of two things. You have a bad Genesis revision, or the capacitors are starting to dry out and they aren't filtering properly anymore. If it's totally dead, make sure the power brick hasn't joined the ghosts. If it's not cables, caps, games, or bricks, something is likely dead on the motherboard, 
And it's time to find some schematics and break out a multimeter. One last thing to note, if you're playing an older game with a six button controller and it's acting weird or not responding at all, hold the mode button on top of the gamepad as you're pressing the power button. This puts the controller into a three button compatibility mode and it should solve the issue. This doesn't apply to that many games, so it's not something I'd fret about. Retro game stores are the best places to go for game collecting, but unfortunately, these aren't common unless you live in Seattle or Oregon or something. But fortunately, you can find almost anything you're looking for on eBay. Just play it safe and make sure to read the descriptions. Ask the seller questions if you have to. Um, also, they sell repros on Etsy. Uh, they can be pretty fairly priced, so something to look out for. As for games I recommend for someone starting out, or looking for games I may have missed, I can recommend a few for my personal collection that won't break the bank. A must-own is the Sega 6-Pack. You can get these for very cheap, and it's a great game to get if you have no idea where to start. It comes with Sonic, Super Hang-On, Streets of Rage, Columns, Revenge of Shinobi, and Golden Axe, all in one cartridge. All six are Genesis Essentials. Next up is Aladdin. I know, it's a Disney game, but this was one of the best-selling Genesis games of all time, and for good reason. It sounds amazing, the animations are very fluid, and it's a solid platformer. Pick this up for cheap. If you're into space shooters, this one is kind of unique. Subterranea can be found very affordably, complete in box. It has you fighting against gravity, has awesome boss battles, and an amazing soundtrack. For fighting game fans, pick up your favorite version of Mortal Kombat or Street Fighter and a couple of six-button gamepads and battle your friends. The Genesis ports aren't half bad. And finally, if you own a Genesis, you must get a copy of Virtual Racing. This was the most technologically advanced Genesis game ever made, and it can be found for relatively cheap. It's not the best port of the original arcade game, but it shows the impressive things a game system designed in 1989 could accomplish in 1994. If you've made it this far, holy crap, congratulations, and get yourself a cookie. That was a lot to digest. <laughs> Also, thank you. If this helped you in any way, I'd appreciate it if you hit the like button. If you want more content like this, hit that subscribe button. And in the comments below, let me know what you think is a must-have for any Genesis collector, or leave me feedback. If you've got any questions, ask away. I'll answer to the best of my abilities. I hope this helped you, I hope you learned something, and as always, keep retro rad. Thanks for watching.